This video is part of an audiobook series featuring The Fourth Industrial Revolution, written in 2016 by Klaus Schwab. For more audiobooks, please visit my YouTube channel or my website for downloads. Chapter 3 Impact The scale and breadth of the unfolding technological revolution will usher in economic, social, and cultural changes of such phenomenal proportions that they are almost impossible to envisage. Nevertheless, this chapter describes and analyzes the potential impact of the Fourth Industrial Revolution on the economy, business, governments, and countries, society, and individuals. In all these areas, one of the biggest impacts will likely result from a single force, empowerment, how governments relate to their citizens, how enterprises relate to their employees, shareholders, and customers, or how superpowers relate to smaller countries. The disruption that the fourth industrial revolution will have on existing political, economic, and social models will therefore require that empowered actors recognize that they are part of a distributed power system that requires more collaborative forms of interaction to succeed. Well, that's really important. 3.1. Economy. The fourth industrial revolution will have a monumental impact on the global economy, so vast and multifaceted that it makes it hard to disentangle one particular effect from the next. Indeed, all the big macro variables one can think of, like GDP, investment, consumption, employment, trade, inflation, will be affected. I have decided to focus on only the two most critical dimensions here, growth, in large part through the lens of its long-term determinant productivity, and employment. 3.1.1 Growth The impact that the fourth industrial revolution will have on economic growth is an issue that divides economists. On the one side, the techno-pessimists argue that the critical contributions of the digital revolution have already been made, and that their impact on productivity is almost over. In the opposite camp, techno-optimists claim that technology and innovation are at an inflection point and will soon unleash a surge of productivity and higher economic growth. While I, I acknowledge aspects of both sides of the argument, I remain a pra pragmatic optimist. I am well aware of the potential deflationary impact of technology, even when defined as good deflation, and how some of its distributional effects can favor capital over labor and also squeezes wages and therefore consumption. I also see how the fourth industrial revolution enables many people to consume more at a lower price and in a way that often makes consumption more sustainable and therefore responsible. It is important to contextualize the potential impacts of the fourth industrial revolution on growth with reference to recent economic trends and other factors that contribute to growth. Hmm. In the few years before the economic and financial crisis that began in 2008, the global economy was growing by about 5% a year. If this rate had continued, it would have allowed global GDP to double every 14 to 15 years, with billions of people lifted out of poverty. In the immediate aftermath of the Great Recession, the expectation that the global economy would return to its previous high growth pattern was widespread. But this has not yet happened. The global economy seems to be stuck at a growth rate lower than the post-war average, about 3 to 3.5% 3 .5 a year. Some economists have raised the possibility of a centennial slump and talk about secular stagnation, a term coined during the Great Depression by Alvin Hansen, and recently brought back in vogue by economists Larry Summers and Paul Krugman. Secular stagnation describes a situation of persistent shortfalls of demand, which cannot be overcome even with near-zero interest rates. Although this idea is disputed among academics, it has momentous implications. If true, it suggests that global GDP growth would decline even further. We can imagine an extreme scenario in which annual global GDP growth falls to 2%, which would mean that it would take 36 years for global GDP to double. There are many explanations for slower global growth today, ranging from capital misallocation to over-indebtedness to shifting demographics and so on. I will address two of them in particular, aging and productivity, as both are interwoven with technological progress. Aging. 
The world's population is forecast to expand from 7.2 billion today to 8 billion by 2030 and 9 billion by 2050. This should lead to an increase in aggregate demand. But there is another powerful demographic trend, aging. The conventional wisdom is that aging primarily affects rich countries in the West. This is not the case, however. Birth rates are falling below replacement levels in many regions of the world, not only in Europe, where the decline began, but also in most of South America and the Caribbean, much of Asia, including China and southern India, and even some countries in the Middle East and North Africa, such as Lebanon, Morocco, and Iran. Aging is an economic challenge, because unless retirement ages are drastically increased so that older members of society can continue to contribute to the workforce, an economic imperative that has many economic benefits, the working age population falls at the same time as the percentage of dependent elders increases. As the population ages and there are fewer young adults, purchases of big ticket items such as homes, furniture, cars, and appliances decrease. In addition, fewer people are likely to take entrepreneurial risks because aging workers tend to preserve the assets they need to retire comfortably rather than set up new businesses. This is somewhat balanced by people retiring and drawing down their accumulated savings, in which the aggregate lowers savings and investment rates. These habits and patterns may change, of course, as aging societies adapt. But the general trend is that an aging world is destined to grow more slowly unless the technology revolution triggers major growth in productivity, defined simply as the ability to work harder, sorry, the ability to work smarter rather than harder. The fourth industrial revolution provides us with the ability to live longer and healthier and more active lives. As we live in a society where more than a quarter of the children born today in advanced economies are expected to live to age 100, we will have to rethink issues such as the working age population, retirement, and individual life planning. The difficulty that many countries are showing in attempting to discuss these issues is just a further sign of how we are not prepared to adequately and proactively recognize the forces of change. Productivity. Over the past decade, Productivity around the world, whether measured as labor productivity or total factor productivity, has remained sluggish, despite the exponential growth in technological progress and investment in innovation. The most recent incarnation of the productivity paradox, the perceived failure of technological innovation to result in higher levels of productivity, is one of today's great economic enigmas that predates the onset of the Great Recession and for which there is no satisfactory explanation. Consider, consider the United States, where labor productivity grew on average 2.8% between 1947 and 1983, and 2.6% between 2000 and 2007, compared with 1.3% between 2007 and 2014. Much of this drop is due to the lower levels of TFP, the measure most commonly associated with the contribution to efficiency stemming from technology and innovation. The U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics indicates that TFP growth between 2007 and 2014 was only half a percent, a significant drop when compared to the 1.4 percent annual growth in the period 1995 to 2007. This drop in measured productivity is particularly concerning, given that it has occurred in the 50 largest U.S. companies that have amassed cash assets of more than $1 trillion, despite real interest rates hovering around zero for almost five years. Productivity is the most important determinant of long-term growth and rising living standards, so its absence, if maintained throughout the fourth industrial revolution, means that we will have less of each. Yet how can we reconcile the data indicating declining productivity with the expectations of higher productivity that tend to be associated with the exponential progress of technology and innovation? One primary argument focuses on the challenge of measuring inputs and outputs, and hence discerning productivity. Innovative goods and services created in the fourth industrial revolution are of, higher, of significantly higher functionality and quality, yet are delivered in markets that are fundamentally different from those which we are traditionally used to measuring. Many new goods and services are non-rival, 
have zero marginal costs, and or harness highly competitive markets via digital platforms, all of which result in lower prices. Under these conditions, our traditional statistics may well fail to capture real increases in value, as consumer surplus is not yet reflected in overall sales or higher profits. Hal Varian, Google's chief economist, points to various examples, such as the increased efficiency of hailing a taxi through a mobile app or renting a car through the power of the on-demand economy. There are many other similar services whose use tends to increase efficiency and hence productivity. Yet because they are essentially free, they, are, they, are, they, they therefore provide uncounted value at home and at work. This creates a discrepancy between the value delivered via a given service versus growth as measured in national statistics. It also suggests that we are actually producing and consuming more efficiently than our economic indicators suggest. Another argument is that while the productivity gains from the third industrial revolution may well be waning, the world has yet to experience the productivity explosion created by the wave of new technologies being produced at the heart of the fourth industrial revolution. Indeed, as a pragmatic optimist, I feel strongly that we are only just beginning to feel the positive impact on the world that the fourth industrial revolution can have. My optimism stems from three main sources. First, the fourth industrial revolution offers the opportunity to integrate the unmet needs of two billion people into the world economy, driving additional demands for existing products and services by empowering and connecting individuals and communities all over the world to one, one another. Second, the fourth industrial revolution will greatly increase our ability to address negative externalities and in the process, to boost potential economic growth. Take carbon emissions, a major negative externality, as an example. Until recently, green investing was only attractive when heavily subsidized by governments. This is less and less the case. Rapid technological advances in renewable energy, fuel efficiency, and energy storage not only make investments in these fields increasingly profitable, boosting GDP growth, but they also contribute to mitigating climate change, one of the major global challenges of our time. Third, as I discuss in the next section, businesses, governments, and civil society leaders with whom I interact all tell me that they are struggling to transform their organizations to realize fully the efficiencies that digital capabilities offer. We are still at the beginning of the fourth industrial revolution, and it will require entirely new economic and organizational structures to grasp its full value. Indeed, my view is that the competitiveness rules of the, the competitiveness rules of the fourth industrial revolution are different from previous periods. To remain competitive, both companies and countries must be at the frontier of innovation in all forms, which means that strategies which primarily focus on reducing costs will be less effective than those which are based on offering products and services in more efficient ways, in more innovative ways. As we see today, established companies are being put under pressure, extreme pressure by emerging disruptors and innovators from other industries and countries. The, same could be said for countries that do not recognize the need to focus on building their innovation ecosystems accordingly. To sum up, I believe that the combination of structural factors, over-indebtedness, and aging societies, and systematic ones, the, inter the introduction of the platform and on-demand economies, the increasing relevance of decreasing marginal costs, etc., will force us to rewrite our economic textbooks. The fourth industrial revolution has the potential both to increase economic growth and to alleviate some of the major global challenges we collectively face. We need, however, to also recognize and manage the negative impacts it can have, particularly with regard to inequality, employment, and labor markets. 3.1.2 Employment Despite the potential positive impact of technology on economic growth, it is nonetheless essential to address its possible negative impact, at least in the short term, on the labor market. Fears about the impact of technology on jobs are not new. In 1931, the economist John Maynard Keynes 
famously warned about widespread technological unemployment, quote, due to our discovery of means of economizing the use of labor, outrunning the pace at which we can find new uses for labor, end quote. This proved to be wrong, but what if this time it were true? Over the past few years, the debate has been reignited by evidence of computers substituting for a number of jobs, most notably bookkeepers, cashiers, and telephone operators. The reasons why the new technology revolution will provoke more upheaval than the previous industrial revolutions are those already mentioned in the introduction. Speed, everything is happening at a much faster pace than before. Breadth and depth, so many radical changes are occurring simultaneously and the complete transformation of entire systems. In light of, the, of these driving factors, there is one certainty. New technologies will dramatically change the nature of work across all industries and occupations. The fundamental uncertainty has to do with the extent to which automation will substitute for labor. How long will this take, and how far will it go? To get a grasp on this, we have to understand the two competing effects that technology exercises on employment. First, there is a, dis a destruction effect, as technology-fueled disruption and automation substitute capital for labor, forcing workers to become unemployed or to reallocate their skills el elsewhere. Second, this destruction effect is accompanied by a capitalization effect in which the demand for new goods and services increases and leads to the creation of new occupations, businesses, and even industries. As human beings, we have an amazing ability for adaptation and in, in, ingenuity. But the key here is the timing and extent to which the capitalization effect supersedes the destruction effect and how quickly the substitutions will take. There are roughly two opposing camps when it comes to the impact of emerging technologies on the labor market. Those who believe in happy endings, in which workers displaced by technology will find new jobs and where technology will unleash a new era of prosperity, and those who believe it will lead to a progressive social and political Armageddon by creating technological unemployment on a massive scale. History shows that the outcome is likely to be somewhere in the middle. The question is, what should we do to foster more positive outcomes and help those caught in the transition? It has always been the case that technological innovation destroys some jobs, which it replaces in turn with new ones in a different activity and possibly in another place. Take agriculture as an example. In the U.S., people working on the land consisted of 90% of the workforce at the beginning of the 19th century. But today, this accounts for less than 2%. This dramatic downsizing took place relatively smoothly, with minimal social disruption or endemic employment, unemployment. The app economy provides an example of a new job ecosystem. It only began in 2008 when Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple, let outside developers create applications for the iPhone. By 2015, the, mid, the global app economy was expected to generate over $100 billion in revenues, surpassing the film industry, which has been in existence for over a century. The techno-optimist asks, if we extrapolate from the past, why should it be different this time? They acknowledge that technology can be disruptive, but claim that it will always end up improving productivity and increasing wealth, leading in turn to greater demand for goods and services and new types of jobs to satisfy it. The substance of the argument goes as follows. Human needs and desires are infinite, so the process of supplying them should also be infinite. Barring the normal recessions and occasional depressions, there will always be work for everybody. What evidence supports this, and what does it tell us about what lies ahead? The early signs point to a wave of labor substitutive innovation across multiple industries and job categories, which will likely happen in the coming decades. Labor substitution. Many different categories of work, particularly those that involve mechanically repetitive and precise manual labor, have already been automated. Many others will follow as computing power continues to grow exponentially. Sooner, sooner than most anticipate, the work of professions as different as lawyers, financial analysts, doctors, journalists, accountants, insurance underwriters, or librarians may be partly or completely automated. 
So far, the evidence is thus. The fourth industrial revolution seems to be creating fewer jobs in new industries than previous revolutions. According to an estimate from the Oxford Martin Program on Technology and Employment, only 0.5% of the United States workforce is employed in industries that did not exist at the turn of the century, a far lower percentage than the approximately 8% of new jobs created in new industries during the 1800s and the 4.5% of new jobs created during the 1990s. This is corroborated by a recent U.S. economic census, which sheds some interesting light on the relationship between technology and unemployment. It shows that innovations in information and other disruptive technologies tend to raise productivity by replacing existing workers rather than creating new products needing more labor to produce them. Two researchers from the Oxford Martin School, economist Carl Benedict Frey and machine learning expert Michael Osborne, have quantified the potential effect of technological innovation on unemployment by ranking 702 different professions according to the probability effect of technological innovation on unemployment. Oh, sorry, according to their probability of being automated, from the least susceptible to the risk of automation, zero corresponding to no risk at all, to those that are the most susceptible to the risk, with one corresponding to a certain risk of the job being replaced by a computer of some sort. In Table 2, I highlight certain professions that are most likely to be automated and those least likely. Most prone to automation are telemarketers, tax preparers, insurance appraisers, auto damage, umpires, referees, and sport officials, legal secretaries, uh, host, hostess, restaurant, lounge, and coffee shop, real estate brokers, farm labor contractors, secretaries, and admin assistants except in legal, medical, and executive, and couriers and messengers. Least prone to automation are mental health and substance abuse social workers, choreographers, physicians and surgeons, psychologists, human resource managers, computer system analysts, anthropologists and archaeologists, marine engineers and naval architects, sales managers, and chief executives. Hmm. The research concludes that about 47% of total employment in the U.S. is at risk, perhaps over the next decade or two, characterized by a much broader scope of the job destruction at a much faster pace than labor market shifts experienced in previous industrial revolutions. In addition, the trend is toward greater polarization in the labor market. Employment will grow in high-income cognitive and creative jobs and low-income manual occupations, but it will greatly diminish for middle-income, routine, and repetitive jobs. It is interesting to note that it is not only the increasing abilities of algorithms, robots, and other forms of non-human assets that are driving the substitution. Michael Osborne observes that a critical enabling factor for automation is the fact that companies have worked hard to better define and simplify jobs in recent years as part of their efforts to outsource, offshore, and allow them to be performed as digital work, such as Amazon's Mechanical Turk, or MTurk service, a crowdsourcing internet platform. This job simplification means that algorithms are better placed or are better able to replace humans as discrete, well-defined tasks lead to better monitoring and more higher quality data around the task, therefore creating a better base from which algorithms can be designed to do the work. In thinking about the automation and the phenomenon of substitution, we should resist the temptation to engage in polarized thinking about the impact of technology on employment and the future of work. As Frey and Osborne's work shows, it is almost inevitable that the fourth industrial revolution will have a major impact on labor markets and workplaces around the world. But this does not mean that we face a man versus machine dilemma. In fact, in the vast majority of cases, the fusion of digital, physical, and biological technologies driving the current changes will serve to enhance human labor and cognition, meaning that leaders need to prepare workforces and develop education models to work with and alongside increasingly capable, connected, and intelligent machines. Impact on skills. In the foreseeable future, 
Low risk jobs in terms of automation will be those that require social and creative skills. In particular, decision making under uncertainty and the development of novel ideas. This, however, may not last. Consider one of the most pro- creative professions writing in the advent of automated narrative generation. Sophisticated algorithms can create narratives in any style appropriate to a particular audience. The content is so human sounding that a recent quiz by the New York Times showed that when reading two similar pieces, it is impossible to tell which one has been written by a human and which one is the product of a robot. The technology is progressing so fast that Kristen Hammond, co founder of Narrative Science, a company specializing in auditive narrative generation, forecasts that by the mid 2020s, 90% of news could be generated by an algorithm. Most of it without any kind of human intervention, apart from the design of the algorithm, of course. In such a rapidly evolving working environment, the ability to anticipate future employment trends and needs in terms of the knowledge and skills required to adapt becomes even more critical for all stakeholders. These trends vary by industry and geography, and so it is important to understand the industry and country specific outcomes of the fourth industrial revolution. In the forum's Future of Jobs report, we asked the chief human resource comp- officers of today's largest employers in 10 industries and 15 economies to imagine the impact on employment, jobs, and skills up to the year 2020. As Figure 1 shows, survey respondents believe that complex problem solving, social, and system skills will be far more in demand in 2020 when compared to physical abilities or content skills. The report finds that the next five years are a crit- critical period of transition. The overall employment outlook is flat, but there is significant job churn within industries and skills within most occupations. While wages and work life balance are expected to improve slightly for most occupations, job security is expected to worsen in half of the industries surveyed. It is also clear that women and men will be affected differently. Potentially exacerbating gender inequality. The 10th edition of the World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap Report 2015 revealed two worrying trends. First, at the current pace of progress, it will take another 118 years before economic gender parity is achieved around the world. Second, progress toward parity is remarkably slow and possibly stalling. In light of this, it is critical to consider the impact of the fourth industrial revolution on the gender gap. How will the accelerating pace of change in technologies that span the physical, digital, and biological worlds affect the role that women are able to play in the economy, politics, and society? An important question to consider is whether female dominated or male dominated professions are more susceptible to automation. The forum's Future of Jobs report. Indicates that significant job losses are likely to span both types. While there has tended to be more unemployment due to automation in sectors in which men dominate, such as manufacturing, construction, and installation, the increasing capabilities of artificial intelligence and the ability to digitize tasks in service industries indicate that a wide range of jobs, from positions at call centers in emerging markets, The source of livelihoods for large numbers of young female workers who are the first in their families to work, to retail and administrative roles in developed countries, a key employer for lower middle class women, these are at risk. Losing a job has negative effects in many circumstances, but the cumulative effect of significant losses across whole job categories that have traditionally given women access to the labor market is a critical concern. Specifically, It will put at risk single income households, headed by low skilled women, depress total earnings in two income families, and widen the already troubling gender gap around the world. But what about new roles and job categories? What new opportunities could exist for women in a labor market transformed by the fourth industrial revolution? While it is difficult to map the competencies and skills expected in industries not yet created, We can reasonably assume that demand will increase for skills that enable workers to design, build, and work alongside technological systems or in areas that fill the gaps left by these technological innovations. Because men t- still tend to dominate computer science, 
mathematical and engineering professions, increased demand for specialized technical skills may exacerbate gender inequalities. Yet, demand may grow for roles that machines cannot fulfill and which rely on intrinsically human traits and capabilities, such as empathy and compassion. Women are prevalent in many occupations, including psychologists, therapists, coaches, event planners, nurses, and other providers of health care. The key issue here is the relative return on time and effort for roles requiring different technical capabilities, as there is a risk that personal services and other currently female-dominated job categories will remain undervalued. If so, the fourth industrial revolution may lead to further divergence between men's roles and women's. This would be a negative outcome of the fourth industrial revolution, as it would increase both inequality overall and the gender gap, making it more difficult for women to leverage their talents in the workforce of the future. It would also put at risk the value created by increased diversity and the gains that we know organizations can make from the enhanced creativity and efficiency of having gender-balanced teams at all levels. Many of the traits and capabilities traditionally associated with women and female professions will be much more needed in the era of the fourth industrial revolution. While we, while we cannot predict the different impact on men and women that the fourth industrial revolution will have, we should take the opportunity of a transforming economy to redesign labor policies and business practices to ensure that both men and women are empowered to their full extent. In tomorrow's world, many new positions and professions will emerge, driven not only by the fourth industrial revolution, but also by non-technological factors such as demographic pressures, geopolitical shifts, and new social and cultural norms. Today, we cannot foresee exactly what these will be, but I am convinced that talent, more than capital, will represent the critical production factor. For this reason, scarcity of a skilled workforce rather than the availability of capital is more likely to be the crippling limit of innovation, competitiveness, and growth. This may give rise to a job market increasingly segregated into low-skill, low-pay, and high-skill, high-pay segments, or as author and Silicon Valley software entrepreneur Martin Ford predicts, a hollowing out of the entire base of the job skills pyramid, leading in turn to growing inequality and an increase in social tensions unless we prepare for these changes today. Such pressures will force us to reconsider what we mean by high skill in the context of the fourth industrial revolution. Traditional definitions of skilled labor rely on the presence of advanced or specialized education and a set of des defined capabilities within a profession or domain of expertise. Given the increasing rate of change of technologies, the fourth industrial revolution will demand and place more emphasis on the ability of workers to adapt continuously and learn new skills and approaches within a variety of contexts. The forum's Future of Jobs study also showed that less than 50% of chief human resource officers are at least reasonably confident in their organization's workforce strategy to prepare for these shifts. The main barriers to a more decisive approach include companies' lack of understanding of the nature of disruptive changes, little or no alignment between workforce strategies and firms' innovation strategies, resource constraints, and short-term profitability pressures. As a consequence, there is a mismatch between the magnitude of the upcoming changes and the relatively marginal actions being taken by companies to address these challenges. Organizations require a new mindset to meet their own talent needs and to mitigate undesirable societal outcomes. Impact on Developing Economies it is important to reflect upon what this might mean for developing countries. Past phases of the Industrial Revolution have not yet reached many of the world's citizens, who still do not have access to electricity, clean water, sanitation, and many types of capital equipment taken for granted in advanced economies. Despite this, the Fourth Industrial Revolution will inevitably impact developing economies. As yet, the precise impact of of the fourth industrial revolution remains to be seen. In recent decades, although there has been a rise in inequality between countries, the disparity across countries has decreased significantly. 
Does the fourth industrial revolution risk reversing the narrowing of the gaps between economies that we have seen to date in terms of income, skills, infrastructure, finance, and other areas? Or will technologies and rapid changes be harnessed for development and hasten leapfrogging? These difficult questions must be given the attention they require, even at a time when the most advanced economies are preoccupied with their own challenges. Ensuring that swaths of the globe are not left behind is not a moral imperative. It is a critical goal that would mitigate the risk of global instability due to geopolitical and security challenges such as migration flows. One challenging scenario for low-income countries is that the fourth industrial revolution leads to a significant reshoring of global manufacturing to advanced economies, something very possible if access to low-cost labor no longer drives the competitiveness of firms. The ability to develop strong manufacturing sectors serving the global economy based on cost advantages is a well-worn development pathway, allowing countries to accumulate capital, transfer technology, and raise incomes. If this pathway closes, many countries will have to rethink their models and strategies of industrialization. Whether and how developing economies can leverage the opportunities of the fourth industrial revolution is a matter of profound importance to the world. It is essential that further research and thinking be undertaken to understand, develop, and adapt the strategies required. The danger is that the fourth industrial revolution would mean that a winner-takes-all dynamic plays out between countries as well as within them. This would further increase social tensions and conflicts and create a less cohesive, more volatile world, particularly given that people are today much more aware of and sensitive to social injustices and the discrepancies in living conditions between different countries. Unless public and private sector leaders assure citizens that they are executing credible strategies to improve people's lives, social unrest, mass migration, and violent extremism could intensify, thus creating risks for countries at all stages of development. It is crucial that people be secure in the belief that they can engage in meaningful work to support themselves and their families. But what happens if there is insufficient demand for labor, or if the skills available no longer match the demand? 3.1.3 the nature of work. The emergence of a world where the dominant work paradigm is a series of transactions between a worker and a company, more than an enduring rate relationship, was described by Daniel Pink 15 years ago in his book, Free Agent Nation. This trend has been greatly accelerated by technological innovation. Today, the on-demand economy is fundamentally altering our relationship with work and the social fabric in which it is embedded. More employers are using the human cloud to get things done. Professional activities are dissected into precise assignments and discrete projects and then thrown into a virtual cloud of aspiring workers located anywhere in the world. This is the new on-demand economy, where providers of labor are no longer employees in the traditional sense, but rather independent workers who perform specific tasks. As Arun Sundarajan, the professor at the Stern School of Business in New York University, put it in a New York Times column by journalist Farhad Manju, we may end, quote, we may end up with a future in which a fraction of the workforce will do a portfolio of, thi portfolio of things to generate an income. You could be an Uber driver, an Instacart shopper, an Airbnb host, and a task rabbit, end quote. The advantages for companies, and particularly fast-growing startups in the digital economy, are clear. As human cloud platforms classify workers as self-employed, they are, for the moment, free from the requirement to pay minimum wages, employer taxes, and social benefits. As explained by Daniel Callahan, chief executive of MBA and company in the UK, in a Financial Times article, quote, You can now get whoever you want, whenever you want, how, exactly how you want it. And because they're not employees, you don't have to deal with employment hassles and regulations, end quote. For the people who are in the cloud, the main advantages reside in the freedom to work or not, and the unrivaled mobility that they enjoy in belonging to a global virtual network. Some independent workers see this as offering the ideal combination of a lot of freedom, less stress, and greater job satisfaction. 
Although the human cloud is in its infancy, there is already substantial anecdotal evidence that it entails silent offshoring, silent because the human cloud platforms are not listed and do not have to disclose their data. Is this the beginning of a new and flexible work revolution that will empower any individual who has an internet connection and that will eliminate the shortage of skills? Or will it trigger the onset of an inexorable race to the bottom in a world of unregulated virtual sweatshops? If the result is the latter, a world of the precariat, a social class of workers who move from task to task to make ends meet while suffering a loss of labor rights, bargaining rights, and job security, would this create a potent source of social unrest and political instability? Finally, could the development of the human cloud merely accelerate the automation of human jobs? The challenge we face is to come up with new forms of social and employment contracts that suit the changing workforce and the evolving nature of work. We must limit the downside of the human cloud in terms of possible exploitation, while neither curtailing the growth of the labor market nor preventing people from working in the manner they choose. If we are unable to do this, the fourth industrial revolution could lead to the dark side of the future of work, in which Linda Gretton, Gratton, a professor of management practice at London Business School, describes in her book titled The Shift, The Future of Work is Already Here, increasing levels of fragmentation, isolation, and exclusion across societies. As I state throughout this book, the choice is ours. It entirely depends on the policy and institutional decisions we make. One has to be aware, however, that a regulatory backlash could happen thereby reasserting the power of policymakers in the process and straining the adaptive forces of a complex system. The importance of purpose. We must also keep in mind that it is not only about talent and skills. Technology enables greater efficiency, which most people want. Yet they also wish to feel that they are not merely part of the process, but of something bigger than themselves. Karl Marx expressed his concern that the process of specialization would reduce the sense of purpose that we all seek from work, while Buckminster Fuller cautioned that the risks of over-specialization tend, quote, to shut off the wide-band tuning searches and thus to preclude further discovery of the all-powerful generalized principles, end quote. Huh. Now, faced with a combination of increased complexity and hyper-specialization, we are at a point where the desire for purposeful engagement is becoming a major issue. This is particularly the case for members of the younger generation, who often feel that corporate jobs constrain their ability to find meaning and purpose in life. In a world where boundaries are disappearing and aspirations are changing, people want not only work-life balance, but also harmonious work-life integration. I am concerned that the future of work will only allow a minority of individuals to achieve such fulfillment. Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, and visit my channel for more exciting content.